Greetings, everyone. Welcome to our exclusive Global Leading Voices webinar campaign. We are delighted to have you join us here today. Please be informed that if you have any questions during the presentation, you may type them into the question box in your control panel. The presenter will answer your questions at the end of the presentation accordingly. Now, without further ado, we will turn the time over to our presenter, who will begin shortly. Well, good morning. It's uh, great to be with you today. I'm actually uh, coming from Michigan. I'm, my name is Dan Lorman, and uh, I am the Chief Security Officer with Security Mentor Incorporated. We do security awareness training around the world. Uh, it's great to be with you uh, from a very cold Michigan. It's actually minus five degrees outside here. Uh, wind chills in Michigan today, uh, end of January, are down to minus 30. I know I just talked to Chris Hobbs, who we're going to hear from in a minute. It's very cold in Nebraska. Probably not, not as cold in, in North Carolina, where Maria Thompson will be speaking to us uh, from North Carolina. But just want to briefly introduce myself, uh, uh, introduce the panelists. Um, our plan today is to actually go through some of the top security predictions in the security industry, um, and then also hear from two of our leading national CISOs in the country, uh, the United States, uh, Maria Thompson and Chris Hobbs. Let me start by just introducing myself. Um, my uh, name is, again, Dan Lorman. I am the uh, CSO with Security Mentors, I mentioned, but I started my career at the National Security Agency. I was in England with Lockheed and Mantec during the 1990s, and I spent 17 years in Michigan government uh, working on a wide variety of different roles um, from Y2K in the late 90s through to uh, work through the 9-11 you know, the, the uh, issues in the governor's office and a CISO, uh, CTO, and CSO, a Chief Security Officer in Michigan. So um, a lot of experience in government, working with uh, people in the White House in Washington, uh, Homeland Security, and, and um, governments around the world. I've been with Security Mentor now the last four and a half years. Uh, it's been a great run, and we have an uh, award-winning set of products that we offer. We're not going to talk about those today. But I want to just briefly give um, our two other panelists uh, an opportunity to introduce themselves. Then we'll dive right into the top uh, cyber threat predictions for 2019. Um, we also want to mention that we, you do have an opportunity to ask questions. So we, we want to encourage you to write your questions in the uh, box, and we will be addressing those at the end of the uh, hour, uh, the last 15 minutes. So I um, want to hand it off first to uh, Maria Thompson, who is the uh, chief risk officer and an award-winning um, uh, government C, uh, Chief Security Officer, slash Chief Risk Officer from North Carolina. So, welcome, Maria. Thank you, Dan. Uh, pleasure being to being here today. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to uh, present. Um, as you stated, my name is Maria Thompson. I've been with the state of North Carolina for roughly four years now as the uh, state's Chief uh, Risk and Security Officer. Um, prior to that, I began my career within the Marine Corps. And I'm sure Dan's path and mine may have crossed at some point or the other. Uh, I spent 20 years in the Marine Corps, um, retired as the cybersecurity chief, and from there did a few stints as a you know, contractor in the federal world um, in working in various security roles and positions. And now I'm at the state. So I'm, I'm really happy to be here. As you can see, I've been doing my rounds within the government space, and uh, it's been a very rewarding um, experience. Great. Well, thanks so much, Maria. It's great to have you. Uh, Maria and Chris both are just national leaders in cybersecurity, so it's, it's really a, a thrill to have them on the panel today. Uh, I want to hand it back over to Chris Hobbs in Nebraska. Chris, I know it's cold out there as well. Uh, how are you doing hey. this morning? Doing well, Dan. Thank you very much. I totally appreciate being here. Um, yeah, it, it is very cold here. It's uh, uh, driving in today this morning. I was it was eight below zero, so I think we had the same wind chill factor of. of of negative 30 with uh, with the wind and everything, so it's it's bitterly cold here. It's really hard to get out and 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 get in the car and come on into work, but um, um, but we did it. Um, I started my career uh, uh, cybersecurity career pretty much like uh, you guys did. Um, I was in the military, uh, uh, working in a military intelligence uh, uh, unit uh, uh, for the army, uh, and in. Back in 1995, I started with the state of Nebraska with the Department of Revenue. Uh, my main functions there were security officer and um, uh, IT management. Um, our big responsibility at that point in time was compliance, and that's something that that is still ongoing for me uh, is is compliance. So I take a look at all of the federal re regulations that are out there uh, that we need to adhere to. Uh, we have tons of them. 
you know, we have uh, federal tax information, we have payment card industry information, uh, uh, protected health information. So we run the gambit with regards to what we need to protect. So uh, in 2012, uh, I became the state information security officer uh, for Nebraska. Uh, and like I said, uh, compliance is still one of my major responsibilities here. So, um, and going forward, uh, I think it's it's really my goal to expand awareness of, of cybersecurity in all of the state agencies that we have here at Nebraska, but also local governments and and, and some of the local uh, political subdivisions. Great. Well, thanks so much. And we're going to hear um, more from Maria and Chris specifically about what's going on in their states um, after I go through the top cyber th uh, threat predictions for 2019. I um, want to just uh, start off with a quick cyber threat recap. Um, as we did last year, many of you may have joined us. Uh, uh, we had uh, the CISOs last year from Missouri and from Delaware, uh, Lane Starkey and Mike Rowling, um, who uh, really gave us their perspective from their states. And it's, again, great to have uh, North Carolina and Nebraska this year. Uh, but really, as we look back over the last trends, every year um, there's been some headline stories um, you can really go back and, and, you know, I've written about this over the last really decade, but 2015 was the year data breaches became much more intimate. And that wasn't just because of Ashley Madison, but there were a lot of uh, much more personal breaches. It wasn't just about big data and banks. Um, of course, 2016, we saw a lot of election uh, interference, hacktivism, um, hackers stole the show with a cause. It was, again, just not a lot of big uh, data breaches related to money, finances, banks, but also you know the election and other topics became hot. Certainly in 2017, we saw um, data, you know, the Equifax breach. We saw a number of big data breaches, but we also saw the big hurricanes. And I know a lot of teams in, in government especially were working on emergency response. In many cases, the emergency response teams and the cyber teams worked together uh, because, un unfortunately, the bad actors will use those emergencies to put out phishing attacks and lots of other, you know, things going on in the world often, you know, we're now merging with what's going on in cyberspace. So we saw that more and more in 2017. And then as we go into 2018, um, we saw these trends. And, and as I talk about the top, the top uh, predictions in the industry and, and kind of give this quick overview, and I definitely want to hear Maria and Chris's uh, perspectives on some of this as we go through some of these, we started seeing, um, we really, these are coming from the top security companies in the world. So really what I do every year is I chronicle, and you can go to GovTech.com, read the details behind these uh, and and see kind of you know what what the major vendors what the major uh, leaders thought leaders around the world are saying are coming and uh, we look back at you know 2018 uh, was really the year that privacy took center stage we had GDPR certainly was a major story last year a lot of uh, predictions you're going to start seeing those in a few minutes uh, for 2019 is you're going to see more regulation around those and, and we've already seen some sign uh, some fines some of the predictions were around, you know, more fines for GDPR. We've already seen some of those uh, from European, from the EU already in 2019 during the month of January. So, but, you know, trend, um, so things that we saw this year, ransomware model, um, still a cybercrime mainstay. Again, these were 2018. Fraud as a service, blockchain, uh, which certainly was a big story, the rise and fall of Bitcoin last year, but how the um, dark web uses blockchain. Uh, excuse me, uses Bitcoin um, in, and uh, uses uh, encryption um, for good and, and for evil. There's a lot of good stories about Bitcoin and also uh, some, some scary stories out there. More DDoS attacks via IoT. We certainly saw a lot of that. Uh, fake news became a top story in 2018, as, as it was earlier, but it really kind of uh, continued to evolve and to become uh, probably even more uh, widespread. Uh, more election issues, you know, the 2018 midterms, we saw a lot of discussions around election, uh, different aspects of that. Um, and then, you know, the, really the arms race, and you're gonna, we're going to talk a little bit about AI, artificial intelligence, and the arms race in technology as we move into 2019. So if we think about the 2019 predictions, and, and, you know, heading into this year, again, you can see these details at this GovTech.com blog. These slides will be available. You can also replay this um, session. Uh, it's going to be available on demand for you on a variety of, of PECB channels. You'll be able to access this. But um, I want to start off with what some of the common agreement is out there, and then maybe some areas of disagreement, and then I'm going to walk through what I consider to be some 
five of the top vendor predictions that are out there for this year. Um, almost everyone agrees. So this is a list. It's kind of the easy list. Some people would even say this is, you know, kind of deja vu from what happened in 2018. Um, it's more of the same. You hear that prediction a lot. Nothing will change. Those kind of one-liners. But, uh, you know, this issue around more data breaches, we're going to see more big data breaches, more big data breaches announced. And that's not just, you know, ones that just happened, but ones that maybe happened years ago that were just uncovered. Bad, bad actors are still in the lead. Almost everybody is saying the bad guys are ahead of the good guys. Uh, by a substantial margin in most cases. IoT, Internet of Things, um, you know, maybe not so smart when it comes to security. There were a couple reports that just came out in the last week uh, that really talked about how insecure a lot of IoT devices are. And uh, that's kind of the bleeding edge of the whole Internet, right? So more and more devices, uh, more and more items that have not been traditional computing um, needing that security around them. Explosion of data collection, uh, again, continuing on, you know, more and more devices reporting back in from IoT devices, um, you know, smart meters, you know, all kinds of different um, smart homes, smart cities, all sending in data. More infrastructure vulnerabilities will cause outages. So, again, not just about data, but, you know, God forbid that somebody brought down electricity right now in Michigan because we need the heat. Uh, it's cold. And in Nebraska and other parts of the country, Midwest, it's, it's really cold right now. So, you know, we want to make sure that critical infrastructure stays up. And then very few um, predictions around Cyber 9-11 or Cyber Pearl Harbor. Interestingly enough, there were a lot more dire predictions a few years back. I just point this out because a lot of very, very smart people have said, you know, they don't want to predict in any one given year that we're going to have some major catastrophe, but, and yet the top leaders say we will have something in three to five years. So there continue to be longer term predictions that people think within the next, next decade or something, we might have more um, issues. Some areas of disagreement include artificial intelligence. Um, number of companies think AI is really going to be a game changer. I think most of the companies in the, in the industry are saying that it will be during the 20s. The question is, will that really happen in 2019? You have a big divergence, for example, between IBM and Forcepoint out there right now. IBM pushing AI, saying AI is a game changer. It's going to really help solve the cyber talent challenge. It's really going to... Uh, you know, solve a lot of your problems, and it, it's really changing the, the whole game right now. Force Point has made the statement, sure, there's machine learning, there's some uh, big data, you know, crunching going on, but there's no real true AI happening, and nor will it happen in 2019. So, again, there's differences of opinion around, you know, AI in the short term, not so much the medium the long term. Biggest threats around cloud versus mobile versus critical infrastructure. Again, you'll see different vendors focus. One thing to watch out for here as you're going through these predictions, um, what does that vendor do? Interestingly enough, a lot of the cloud vendors will talk about cloud's the biggest threat. Mobile, you know, same. Critical infrastructure, the same. So, you know, look at, look at, the, uh, look at the products and services the companies are, are providing before you really, um, you know, as, you, as you're trying to decide which threat you want to look at. Sectors to be hard as tit. Again, a lot of different opinions out there. A lot of people saying hospitals. Um, so far, it's predicted fewer, better adversaries. Uh, we expect we'll eventually be left with fewer but smarter and stronger adversaries, while others are predicting the rise and return of more small guy hackers and more hacktivists. So, you know, more kind of um, – and actually, I'm in that second group. <laughs> I think you, you will see a few stronger, better adversaries, but I think more and more countries around the world are developing their own offensive cyber capabilities, uh, more and more bad actors all over the world. Uh, people are, are – realizing that cybercrime, unfortunately, right now, it does pay, and unfortunately, um, they are, you know, getting into the game. So I think you're going to see both, um, but I, I don't think you're going to see necessarily an end to the hacktivism. Um, what do we even name predictions, trends, forecast threats? What I mean by that is, uh, you know, different people call it different things. Some people say predictions, some say trends, some say forecasts. Just think here about, you know, the weather forecast. You know, we don't say weather prediction. Maybe you do. Um, trends, you know, you know, maybe more over the course of, uh, of decades um, or, or, or multiple years. One thing to watch out for, I have a piece coming out in CSO Magazine that's really going to focus on a lot more people are getting involved in, in the plans for the next decade. So uh, Christmas will come early. You know, 2020 predictions may be coming out mid-year because people are going to be looking, you know, 2020, think vision, like eyesight, your 2020 eyesight. What is your vision? What is your, what is your strategy over the next decade, over the next five years? 
um, and, and, you know, what are you doing about it? Now, I'm not going to walk through each of these. I, I mentioned five vendors. I want to give uh, Maria and, and, uh, Maria and, um, and uh, Chris a uh, chance to respond uh, to maybe one thing that sticks out to them after mentioning each of these vendors and then another five or ten minutes talking about uh, – Five, seven minutes talking about some of these major vendor forecasts. Trend Micro always does a great job every year putting together prediction reports. One thing I want to mention here about these, just kind of one-off blogs that list a bunch of predictions that are kind of random. You can go to these vendors and many others that are listed in my blog, the 19 top for, for 2019, and you can actually see a complete report. Some of these reports are 50 to 100 pages with a lot of research behind them, a lot of science behind them. They're not just kind of random you know, predictions people are pulling out of the air. They've done a lot of research. They've connected the dots over the last several years, and they really see these are the trends that are really going to make a difference. They may not saying they're all going to be right, but this is what they predict, you know, things like um, – uh, mass real-world use of breach credentials will be seen. 99% of exploited-based attacks will still not be based on zero-day vulnerability. So what, what they're trying to get at there, like I'm not going to read through this whole list, but what they're trying to get at is, you know, a lot of people focus on zero days, but there's a lot of cyber hygiene tackling and, you know, blocking and basic, you know, good, you know, uh, uh, actions that people can take with known vulnerabilities and they're just and you know enterprises are just struggling to patch you know their those uh those known vulnerabilities that are out there and and the and the, the active exploits that are out there on the internet so let me start with maria maria is there anything that jumps out with you uh on this slide that that you can kind of you think rings true at all it could be north carolina or just nationwide any one thing you want to mention about trend micro no, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly, or well, with the Trend Micro report, as far as the uh, zero-day vulnerabilities. Um, that is something that I think across the board, not just in the state of North Carolina, but worldwide, globally, we are struggling with is patching. And what we tend to do is we chase after the next shiny tool, because we think that this solution will help to fix the underlying problem that we have, which is patch poor patch management. And unfortunately, it doesn't do that. And we are struggling because we have to deal with the, the fact that we're under-resourced. So we don't have all these people to sit there and, and have eyes on glass 24 by 7, 365 to parse through all the noise in order to get this information. Whereas if we patched, we could be uh, definitely listening that, that, uh, uh, that security uh, gap that we have. Uh, but we, we tend to not do that. And, I so, and it, it's funny that one of the predictions earlier or one of the disagreements, no one seemed to mention the fact that there will always be the battle, the constant battle between operations and security. And somehow that, that challenge is something that we need to bridge in order to make sure that we have better patch management. Great. That's really great, great insights there. Thanks so much. I'm going to keep moving here because I want to get, we're going to hear more from Maria and from Chris about their specific state situation after I go through these five major vendors. But FireEye, a great report from Kevin Mandia. Uh, really encourage you to go read it, uh, whether you're a FireEye customer or not. I'm, I, these are vendor agnostic views from my perspective. I just think they're really some smart people out there that you should be reading and, and listening to. Um, you know, nations developing more offensive capabilities. You see a lack of resources that Maria just talked about that, you know, for small, medium-sized companies. Even large enterprises are struggling. We're going to talk about cyber talent in a few minutes. Uh, supply chain weaknesses, um, cyber espionage, cyber crime, and other threats to the aviation industry. So a lot of different things here. There's a really great five-page letter from Kevin Mandy at the beginning of the FireEye report that I, I encourage you to go out there and read. But Chris, give you a chance here. Anything on this list or something we said earlier that you just want to comment on uh, related to the predictions so far? Oh my gosh, I'm chomping at the bit here to, to, to jump in here. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot here actually. Um, uh, you know, with, with FireEye, I mean, I, I look at this and we're looking at, um, you know, uh, lack of resources. Again, that's that's something that's big in, in our area as well, you know. So um, we need the resources. We need the talent. The talent is lacking here in the state of Nebraska. Um, you know, how do you get that talent in and uh, trained, uh, you know, to be a, a productive uh, employee for you? Um, going back just a little bit, you know, usually with all these predictions, I, I do take them with a grain of salt. Um, I don't always agree with them uh, with regards to, you know, what they are saying. Um, 
basically that's for the for the simple reason that you know okay this is a company that is trying to sell a product okay and Maria mentioned the new shiny tool um, these are the companies if they really want to help us out help us with with regards to our business and processes um, you know the shiny tools we have a lot of shiny tools already that that we can use uh, that are at our disposal um, you know that we can that we can leverage um, uh, to, to help us out in, in cybersecurity what we need is really like the business processes and and you know a clear direction of which which way you know we should be going so um, you know like I said I take these I take these predictions with a grain of salt um, you know um, if I can get a, a company that is going to be forthcoming with regards to, you know, just, you know, straight up, hey, this is what's going on, you know, I, I find that a lot more productive. Great. Well, thanks, for, thanks for that, Chris. Again, we're going to hear from him more about specific Nebraska projects in a few minutes. I'm going to quickly go through McAfee. Um, uh, you know, a lot of great uh, comments here. Uh, Cyber Criminal Underground. Again, they're talking more consolidation here. They were kind of in that camp. Um, synergistic threat will multiply. Uh, these are new words showing up, right? Synergistic threats. Um, you go read about what, what all they mean by that. Interesting stuff. Misinformation, extortion attempts to challenge organization brands. I think that's really huge. Um, you know, the corporate, we've always had competition between, you know, the big boy, you know, uh, re retailers and things, but now misinformation and, and uh, be interesting to see how that, you know, evolves. Voice control, digital assistance, the next vector in attacking IoT devices. So all those home devices you use to, you know, turn on the lights and turn down the thermostat, you know, attacks against IoT and smart homes, um, smart devices, certainly a lot more there. Um, keep moving here. WatchGuard always, I, I think they, you know, for the size of the company, they always do a great report every year. I'm always impressed with their report. AI-driven chatbots go rogue. Again, AI used against people. Um, interesting uh, comment. Nation State launches a fire sale attack. Fireless self-propagating vapor worms. Again, new words showing up. Attackers hold the Internet hostage. There's an interesting one. You know, we talk about ransomware. Um, could somebody go after some of the big boys and uh, hold big chunks of the Internet hostage or, you know, God forbid, the entire Internet? I don't know how exactly they would do that. But uh, Force Point, uh, a lot of great. Uh, comments, the winner of AI, I mentioned that there's no real AI cybersecurity nor any likelihood for it to develop in 2019. Again, they aren't saying AI is not important. They're not saying it's not going to be big over the next decade. They're talking about 2019. Disruption around um, IoT, you know, at scale, attackers will disrupt industrial um, I, in, Internet of Things. Um, courtroom face-offs, you can start seeing more and more cases of um, – uh, employee claims of innocence and employer claims deliberate action, those kinds of things, interesting stuff. Um, driven to the edge, consumers' concern about breaches will cause companies to embrace edge computing in order to enhance privacy. Designers will face significant headwinds with adoption due to low user trust. Um, again, all these are great, great uh, summaries. I just want to wrap up this and then hand it off, make sure we get time to hear from Maria and, and Chris before we take your questions. But I, I kind of every year put together what I just think are some of what I call them Dan Lohman Prediction Awards, but just some things that uh, fill in different categories beyond trust. Millennials ruin everything. It kind of makes me <laughs> laugh. Um, I like that. I mean, I have a lot. I have two millennial daughters, so I'm not, you know, I don't know if millennials are going to ruin everything. But what they're talking about there really is based on a privacy prediction, that the evolving prediction of privacy and how young people don't care and share. So the idea here is that, you know, we have all these big privacy breaches and all this news about Facebook and all these other people. And millennials just seem to share everything online. And they don't, you know, just if it makes my life easier, if, I, if, it's, a, if it's a cool new app, you know, it's fine with me. And so uh, just interesting, interesting. Uh, read more about that at Beyond Trust. Uh, newest and specific, bring your own security. I, I think that's pretty interesting. You know, we're talking about bring your own device, bring your own whatever to work. But now they're saying, you know, malware price says bring your own security. I, I don't trust my office security. I don't trust my government security. I'll bring my own from home. Uh, most scary cyber criminals will compete for dominance in an emerging IoT worm war. Interesting from Trend Micro. Again, the concept here, almost like 1930s Chicago. You know, we're going to see, you know, gangs going out against each other and, and, and kind of running the Internet from, for, for the bad guys. Uh, more large-scale breaches, everyone's saying that. More, most disagreement, again, um, role of AI, I think, is, 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 is my there. And best overall advice, well-known vulnerabilities will continue to dominate cyber attack reports. You know, a lot of people are saying that. You know, there's a lot, again, you know, Maria kind of reconfirmed that. A lot of talk about, you know, different 
um, yes, zero days are huge issues, and you know, new threats coming from the really big nation states are, are, are a big problem. But there's a lot that we can do at the local level, at our state level, at our company level to help. Um, at this point, I'd like to stop and hand it off for the next uh, five to seven minutes and let Maria talk about the cyber threat that North Carolina is seeing and some of their top security projects. So, Maria, take it away. Thanks, Dan. Um, from a North Carolina perspective, what we've been seeing, especially the latter part of, well, mid to latter part of last year and beginning this year, is a lot of business email compromises. And this is um, primarily focused on our local governments um, as well as our academic institutions. Um, they are struggling left and right. And the, the funny thing is that we all know social engineering is the number one um, way in which they're getting into our networks. However, um, what this is forcing a lot of these organizations to do is to relook at their business processes and figure out where they can put those, um, those manual uh, stop gaps or those manual gates to do the checks and balances because these are simple things. We've seen an uptick in e even uh, voice um, or vishing um, within some of our uh, executive agencies as well as um, local government. And so it's really when you know we all hear that stop think before we connect people just need to stop think before they connect um th this is the, the the mantra and i think that if we, if we just slow down our processes and take a look at um you know what we're doing then we can proactively figure out ways to to, to reduce these risks um so uh, business email compromise is definitely a big thing i do see that continuing to be um, a problem within our within our organizations um, definitely phishing. Um, last year, we had a lot of our local go uh, government um, entities get hit by ransomware. And, you know, the good thing, I would say, the most positive thing is that we see now that they are reaching out to state government for support, um, not necessarily as a big brother coming in to, you know, uh, with the Superman cape on to, to save the day, but just to see how we can work together. Um, I think the word is finally getting out to our local government that we are all in this um, together and that we should not make this our own personal journey and we need to embrace each other and cybersecurity is that bridge um, outside of our business processes that we need to, um, to protect. Uh, and then of course, uh, insider threats. Um, we have not specifically received a lot of um, uh, reports on insider threats per se, but I know that that is a growing concern and that is something that we are taking seriously within uh, North Carolina. So we started by uh, the last year introducing the, the state government um, entities to what an insider threat is through training and orientation, so on and so forth. But then the next step now is to build an insider threat program within the state so that we can further that and get that and, and do our assessments to make sure that we are identifying these people. And so, you know, we've, we've talked to some vendors and They've mentioned how AI could help in, you know, identifying whether through business, uh, I'm sorry, uh, behavioral analytics um, can help to identify who these pot potential uh, insider threats could be. But again, you know, from a practical standpoint, um, you know, the concept sounds great, but a practical standpoint is what we see um, boots on the ground is that that's a lot more, a lot of noise, and it needs to mature more before we can fully leverage that capability. Um, within the state, we, you know, we've been tasked with optimizing or consolidating um, our executive branch agencies, and with that opportunity also comes threats. And so we have to make sure that as we uh, embrace these um, entities into the, the, the IT organization, that we normalize the tools that we are using. And so we're, we're, we're starting to see um, definitely a, get a better understanding of the gaps that we have from a cyber tools and capability standpoint and figuring out how we can make sure that we integrate all of these into that big common picture. So if there are any vendors on this call, that's what we want to hear. Those are the types of things that, that will bring value to us within the state of North Carolina is not necessarily um, giving us another tool that is going to be another um, potential uh, glass that we have to pay attention to, but how can that integrate into our environment right now and how can we fully um, take advantage of the um, the capabilities that it has, and and that's uh, you know another issue that we're dealing with as well is taking a look at the tools that we have and making sure that we're doing cyber hygiene on an annual basis, making sure that we're fully 
um, getting the capabilities, taking, uh, taking um, uh, the, the capabilities that these tools can bring to us um, and, and fully deploying them to give us a better view into what is going on within the state. So visibility is very keen for us, especially as we branch into our hybrid cloud model. That is another initiative that we're working on. Um, so there's a lot of things that's moving, um, a lot of moving parts here within the state of North Carolina. Uh, most importantly is our outreach to the local government, uh, making sure that we can normalize our cyber landscape statewide, seeing how we can help our citizens better, not just from pr the protection of their data, but also, you know, in partnering with other organizations, how can we help grandma that is, you know, a victim of fraud get some support to, you know, to, uh, protect herself better. And so it, it takes more than just us looking from our siloed vision into what we have control over and seeing how we can um, get the, the cyber word out to all of, to the, the entire state. So those are some of the things that we're working on, Dan. Great, thanks so much. Maria, really appreciate it. And I just want to reiterate something I said earlier. Maria and Chris are two of the real national leaders, really shining stars. Um, I've worked with people in all 50 states. I work with a lot of federal agencies. I also work with you know, a lot of private sector companies all over the world and two really outstanding uh, security leaders uh, in Maria. One quick follow up, Maria, just 30 seconds, and then I want to jump over to Chris. But I um, want to just ask, you know, how are you dealing with the cyber talent issue? Everyone says cyber talent is a huge challenge, you know, and, and, and getting, you know, attracting and, retra ret and retra uh, retraining, maybe sometimes retraining as well, retaining. Uh, how do you attract and retain cyber talent? You know, that, yeah, that is the, let me get my uh, magic eight ball here to see how, what it says. <laughs> um, that, that is something that I, I know we are all struggling with. And so we have to take a, a multi-faceted um, approach to cybersecurity and, and our workforce within North Carolina. Uh, we have multiple programs right now. We've partnered with some of our industry partners, uh, Cisco, to have, uh, to provide a um, internship programs. We're partnering with our local, um, our community colleges to build pipelines to, to bring fresh um, folks into the cyber world and into state government. Um, we have within our, my office in particular, we have a disabled cyber uh, apprenticeship program where we're this year, we're offering uh, an apprenticeship to 10 uh, veterans. And, and this is a two year program where they are they receive full salaries. They're embedded into our state organizations. And after the two years, uh, they have the, the the organization can either hire them on or, you know, allow them to move on to, you know, private uh, private industries. And I'll tell you, last year um, we graduated our first five, and they were part of the pilot program. And one of them got hired on by uh, uh, Red Hat right off the bat. And we have two that are currently working within in, in our agencies. So again, you know, great success story. Um, we 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 hope to keep building that program, but it, we can't we can't just uh, sit and wait for these folks to show up. Um, we are within North Carolina. We have a lot of um, large companies, large IT organizations. So we are competing with them, and of course, we don't have the salaries that we can, that you know that is competitive um, compared to um, our private sector um, partners. So we have to come up with unique ways to sell the state. How can we um, give them a better uh, work-life balance at the state, um, as well as um, security that in some ways, sometimes you may not necessarily get within a private sector company. So again, partnering with our schools, partnering with our industry partners to figure out how we can utilize and really to keep the folks within North Carolina. Because to me, it's a win regardless of whether they're in the state, uh, a state agency, or they're actually sitting within one of our private sector companies within the state of North Carolina. It's a it's a win from a cyber perspective. Sounds great, great answer, and uh, almost makes me want to move to North Carolina. It sounds <laughs> you're doing a great job, and you know, again, you're a national leader. Thanks a lot. I want to hand it and over the weather to is Tom. nicer here. Yeah, I was gonna say. I was gonna say it's warmer there, Dan. <laughs> it's a lot warmer here. But they do have hurricanes. They do have hurricanes down there. We don't have those in Michigan. Uh, Chris Hobbs, again, another great guy. I got a chance to visit him a few years back, when I was still a CSO in Michigan. And uh, wow, you know, Court Huskers there in Lincoln. You know, that's that's a whole that's a whole nation right there. You know, they're, they're very proud of their their. Uh... Anyway, Chris gave me a tour of the facility, and it's just a great time. Great guy, Chris. Take it away. 
All right, thanks, Dan. I totally appreciate it. And, and you know, honestly, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, echo some of the things that Maria was saying with regards to you know uh, some of the threats that we're seeing out there. You know, I mean, I take a look at uh, take a look at the the threats that you uh, had. Uh, predicted, uh, that some of the uh, different companies had predicted, and you know, running through a lot of that, um, uh, those predictions, um, there was a there was a common factor there, and that was the human factor. You know, I mean, that's something that that you know we have to take a look at going forward um, with regards to um, uh, making sure that um, uh, we're going to be more secure going forward. It, you know, you talk about the millennials and, you know, how they're just freely giving out their 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 information. Um, that's something that, that we do need to fight. I mean, as far as the apathy that is, that is um, out there, I think that is going to be one of the biggest threats uh, going forward. Um, you know, it's not my responsibility. Somebody else is taking care of it. You know, that sort of thing. Um, you know, personal security. I love the fact that, you know, that that they're talking about, you know, Personal security with regards to bringing it into the into the um, into the state or into the uh, uh, into the workplace, um, Internet of Things, home networks, mobile workforce. These are all going to be things that uh, we need to be aware of going forward because you are introducing a lot of risk into your networks if you bring those things into your into those networks. So, uh, like I said, the common factor in, in all of the predictions is the human factor. Um, you know, I, I I look at it. You know, and I say, okay, here we are 30 years after the introduction, 30 plus years after the introduction of the PC, and we're still talking about identity management and passwords and, you know, change your password. I, I don't understand this, why why that is. Um, lack of talent, that's that's another key issue that we have to look, look at uh, going forward. Um, you know, uh, some of the ways that we've been looking at um, augmenting our um, uh, talent base here in Nebraska again is you know like Maria we're going through the through the universities and the uh, um, um, local uh, colleges um, community colleges uh, to try and, and boost our uh, talent force that way uh, we're also hiring uh, uh, independent contractors uh, that we have vetted very well with regards to you know things that they can do uh, and security consultants um, some of the projects that we have going on um, for the past two years, uh, uh, we've been going through a, a consolidation here at the state of Nebraska. Again, the executive branch, you know, uh, all the IT functions are being brought into uh, a central location uh, with the, within the CIO's office. Um, we had a decentralized uh, IT infrastructure. Um, each agency was responsible for their own IT needs, and um, you know. Two years ago, Ed Toner, our CIO, uh, came in and uh, started the con started the consolidation effort in the state. And his goal at that time was to, uh, you know, create efficiencies, reduce costs, um, um, you know, making sure that uh, we are more more secure. Um, you know, we consolidated all the networking functions, all the server rooms, all the server administration, the service desks, the workstations, and the personnel. And it was a huge undertaking, um, but the benefits that we were hoping for, you know, I think have been realized uh, at this point in time. Um, it wasn't always an easy task. Uh, as we move forward with the consolidation, uh, we began to notice areas that we needed to address in order to improve our security posture. Um, you know, since we were a decentralized IT infrastructure, most agencies had their own IT security staff, their own business processes for dealing with security, um, their own security-related devices, whether it was SIM or Active Directory structures. Um, you know, there are standards and guidelines. I mean, each individual agency had their own standards uh, that they had to comply with, uh, um, you know, especially on the federal regulation side. Um, the OCIO here in the state of Nebraska began taking a, a, a kind of a lead role in some, not all of the security related business functions across the state. And some of those that we're looking at right now are identity management, you know, um, onboarding and offboarding of employees. Uh, we have multiple systems out there where identity management was decentralized. So we did had uh, different agencies that had different way of, of authenticating users coming into the system. Um, you know, we also had different applications that had their own IAM uh, structure in place. So we're trying to get all of these um, um, structures uh, consolidated as well. So um, that's something that we're, we're pushing hard and heavy at this point in time. 
Um, the next the next project that we have going on is assessments, um, risk and threat assessments. Uh, each agency being decentralized, again, we were, they were all responsible for performing their own risk assessments. Uh, going forward, we see the benefit of you know performing a standardized risk and threat threat assessment. Um, you know that helps us gain a better knowledge at the state level of the types and of threats that we're seeing. Um, the next project that we have going on, um, and this is actually a project that, that uh, our, our uh, project management office is uh, heading up, um, and that's audits and compliance. Um, you know, one thing that we we noticed was that uh, we were uh, seeing a lot of agencies that were going through an audit or a review, and they would come to us to ask questions with regards to the infrastructure. Um, well, uh, we have agencies that uh, were going through the same review. They would come to us three different times uh, to ask us the same question. And so, you know, the efficiencies that we can gain from, you know, saying, okay, let's take a look at this audit and review as a, as a project and make sure that everybody's on the same page because sometimes they could <laughs> the agencies could get three different answers uh, depending on who they talk to with regards to the infrastructure. So. Um, so that that was that's that's key. Uh, PCI uh, compliance that's that was a big win for us. Um, you know we uh, basically had a lot of business manager with very little uh, in the way of of IT um, uh, knowledge uh, heading up PCI compliance. So um, getting the business partners and the IT partners uh, in the same room and talking about the compliance. That was a, a very key uh, uh, project that we had, um, and it's still ongoing. Uh, you know, we, we've completely changed around how we do our PCI compliance, and it's gonna be a model for how we do the rest of our compliance going forward, so. Yeah, some great, great, great items there, Chris. Thanks so much, and I know PCI, I remember when I was in Michigan government, how, how big of a, you know, the, the the bar keeps getting higher every year, and it's an ongoing challenge, so I appreciate that. One thing you also mentioned, the human factor. I know you uh, in Nebraska and also um, Maria, really, in North Carolina, do a great job at awareness training, security awareness training, not just because you use Security Mentor, but also just you guys just do a lot of things. I mean, you, I know both of you are kind of ambassadors. You get out, you talk to people. Can you talk mm -hmm. to us a little bit about that, you know, how you think about your role in the human factor, like with not just the technical people, but also the wider, you know, you mentioned local government. I know you're on a local government board, but, you know, getting the word out to the business side. I mean, what are some of the things you're doing around security awareness training, but also around the wider question of just getting the word out on, on cyber risk and cyber protections? Sure. Yeah, we uh, we do try and get out as much as we can um, with regards to any of the uh, if anybody is having any kind of get together or gathering, we, you know, we try to get out and and talk to them. Um, you know, <laughs> uh, one thing that, that sticks out to me is that uh, our Department of Tourism um, had a conference at one point in time, and uh, I was able to speak out in Gary, Nebraska, um, with regards to cybersecurity, and that was that was quite interesting. <laughs> Um, but uh, you know, you don't you usually put tourism and cybersecurity together. But it was like, okay, we need to do this. We need to get out there. And, you know, I mean, I have a I have a an opportunity to talk to a lot of businesses um, about cybersecurity and what they need what they need to um, uh, do in order to be safe. You know, I, I think that uh, you know uh, really resonates. I mean, basically getting out there and just talking. I mean, it doesn't matter who you talk to. I mean, getting your getting your message out there is is key. Um, you know, I do have other presentations. I talk to you know a, a majority of the, of the agencies with regards to cybersecurity. Give them presentations. Uh, I'll be talking to Infraguard here um, in April, uh, giving them a presentation on the state of the state of Nebraska with regards to you know what we're seeing uh, as far as threats and things of this nature, pretty much like this. Um, you know, and we also have a uh, an annual cybersecurity conference. And Dan, you've you've given our keynote there at one point in time. Um, the cybersecurity conference is is growing by leaps and bounds. Um, you know, originally it was intended for for uh, uh, state employees to go and, and learn about cybersecurity, but this this thing has grown uh, immensely, um, and so we've had to change venues where we had to get a larger venue uh, to hold the conference. Um, and it is now uh, not just state local governments coming to this conference, but we're also having a lot of businesses, a lot of uh, banking, insurance, 
uh, universities are showing up. Um, so it's it's really showing us the importance of getting that message out there. So, and everybody I think is understanding it. A lot of the companies here in Nebraska are, are understanding that, that, uh, hey, there's there's something to this cybersecurity thing that, you know, we need to make sure that we're up on all the threats. That's great. Thank you so much. And I mean, you do the public-private partnership. I know Maria is doing the same thing in North Carolina. You guys are leaders in that, you know, working with the private sector, looking at, you know, tabletop exercises, you know, all the things you guys are doing around scenario planning and, you know, just really two leading states. So I'm uh, just really impressed with, with, with what's going on in those, both those states. Hey, I want to hand it back over to RDN, who's going to talk to us about um, – uh, their uh, PECB um, offerings, and then we're going to take the questions from the audience. So, audience, take it away. Thank you, Dan, Maria, and Chris for delivering this very informative presentation. I want to inform you that PECB provides training and certification services for ISO 27032 Introduction, Foundation, and Lead Cybersecurity Manager. A PCB certificate in these above-mentioned courses will convey your dedication in implementing and managing uh, these process and frameworks, and most importantly, you will be recognized worldwide. Now, uh, we'll go ahead and take some time to answer some of the questions from uh, the attendees regarding today's topic. The first question is, due to the increase in adoption of cloud services, I believe that sessions hijacking, account takeover, and malicious insider could become major threats. What is your view on it? Maria, why don't you start with that one? Yes, I, one, I agree. I agree with that, um, which is one of the reasons why, as I mentioned earlier, um, that uh, we're focusing on insider threats to, um, to uh, mitigate that risk. So there's there's the human factor, obviously, uh, making sure, and, and and I think we have to also bridge that gap where people have that that they they don't want to narc. I'm doing my quote fingers on uh, you know another um, employee um, because you know whatever fears that they may have. Um, but it, it's important that we take that approach, similar to um, a, a terrorist approach with, with DHHS. That you see something, you say something. Well, it's the same thing. We we need to do that within. Um, within uh, insider threats, as well as to leverage the tools that we have to give us that that um, deep insight into what each um, person may be doing on the network. Chris, your thoughts? You know, uh, as far as the cloud is concerned, that's something that we are moving slowly towards. Uh, we know that, uh, you know, that's the way that everybody is going, um, but we've chosen to take our time with it with regards to actually moving to the cloud. So we want to make sure that we understand exactly what we're doing, what we're what we're getting into, uh, especially with, uh, you know, uh, uh, the identification portion of it. So um, are we moving in that direction? Yes, everybody is. And, and uh, but we, we want to make sure that we understand exactly what it is that we're getting into. Um, you know, policies and standards are all in place at this point in time um, to make sure that, uh, um, you know, the agencies know exactly what their, what their uh, roles and responsibilities are as well. And can I add to that, Dan? Dan, I just want to add that I think what Chris mentioned is very key, which is the roles and responsibilities. And that's one of the big things that the gaps that we see is that folks tend to think that as it pertains to cloud, that they are transferring the risk. Right. And unfortunately, that's not the case. And so there is a learning piece of that that needs to take place. Um, and that uh, when, you know, it has to be a phased approach to Chris's point. Um, so we, as we move to the cloud, we are slowly we're, we're we're moving slowly um but we're a little bit more maybe ag aggressive in that we know that our our agencies are already using clouds in various aspects so we need to figure out how we can put the wrappers around that and get deeper insight into what is going on as the data communicates back and forth from on-prem to the cloud totally agree totally agree yeah i just want to add a couple couple of quick items on that and we'll take the next question i i, I um you know, NASIO, the National Association of State CIOs, has a list of their top 10 priorities every year. And cloud was listed number two. Uh, last, I think, at least five years, maybe seven years, cybersecurity, risk management has been number one. Um, and it is, again, this year, uh, number one. Um, so we're talking about the number one topic in cybersecurity. But number two was cloud. And, and so, you know, more and more people are going to the cloud. The other trend we're seeing a lot that I'm seeing a lot around the country as I travel the world um, is is cloud access security brokers you know knowing about that right. um that whole um call it 
uh, you know, the other side, the uh, hidden hidden part. A lot of times the CIOs and CISOs are not, you know, um, the shadow IT, some people call it, um, that, you know, people are accessing apps, they're accessing different services um, online. And, you know, getting your arms around that as security professionals, knowing that CASB market, you know, the rogue IT, some people call it, um, or people going to things. It may even be a legitimate service, but you're going there as an unauthorized. So where is that data being stored? We tell the joke way back when, I just throw this out here. I remember back probably now eight years ago now when I was CSO in Michigan, um, we had somebody, we, we, were doing a, we were doing a survey like you did, Chris, and uh, true story, I, we were talked to one agency and that was not using our backup for our PCs. And we said, well, how, why are you guys not doing it? Well, you're too expensive. I'm like, well, what are you using? <laughs> and he said, well, we're using free, you know, free China internet and, uh, <laughs> and it literally, <laughs> this guy was, this guy was using a free service in China, you know, to back up his PC, which sounds funny. It's like, and you know, we shut that down real quick, but we didn't have that <laughs> insight at the time to really know that this was going on. There was a handful of people. It wasn't very much. And thankfully there was no big data that got out, but I mean, that's the kind of thing, you know, being aware of everything that's going on. And so you've got these enterprise cloud projects, but you've also got individuals that are out there doing things that are, that are storing data places. Maybe they shouldn't be storing it, et cetera. So getting your arms around that, I think that CASB, that CASB solution is growing, I think, both in the federal government with FedRAMP, um, but also in states and local governments, you're going to start seeing more and more adoption of the cloud. Some faster like North Carolina, some slower like Nebraska. Artie, right. next question. Uh, thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, can please one of you uh, explain simply what synergetic threat means? Synergetic threat, great question. Um, you want to start, any, any, any takers there, Chris and Maria, or do you want me to try and take a stab at it? I don't know. It's, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting one um, that, that's a new term that just came out. So um, uh, any thoughts? I think you can take it, Dan. <laughs> okay, I mean, I, you know, that, what I think they meant by that, um, if you look at if you look at the report, um, they're really saying that um, you know when you when you start seeing different um, threats coming together, different I say synergies of threats. So you know, synergy, you know, uh, different um, uh, different aspects of threats. That, that 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 are cutting across traditional boundaries. You know, we we, t we typically think of phishing. We you know Maria talked about BEC business email compromise. People talk about DDoS. People talk about ransomware. People talk about different things. And 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 so synergies of threats. The 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 idea here, the concept really is more of one of um, um, a blended threat almost, maybe another term for it. But synergies where threats are working together. Um, exactly. You know that. That they're not, um, you know, it, it's not clearly one category or one stovepipe versus another, um, and so you may see some crossover. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot of different, you know, th there's not just ransomware. You know, people like people hold, you know, people talk about ransomware for hospitals, or you know, you know, we we know about that, or for, you know, Maria talked about ransomware for, um, you know, local governments in North Carolina. Um, but also, you know, different threats that are kind of blending, that are using aspects of, of different, um, well, I mean, I guess really kind of a blended threat model, but is another term for that. And, and, and maybe even new ways that uh, different groups might be working together as well. Um, you know, you, you t you've already heard the term malware as a service that came out a few years ago, but really different organizations, different threats coming together. Is that, does that sound right, Chris? Yeah, it sure does. You know, I mean, it's not just the the um, the technologies that are are you know coming together. It's also the people that are coming together. So, the threat actors um, uh, are coming together to to form this this more synergistic uh, threat level for us. Totally agree. And Maria, any any comments on that or not? Uh, no. I, well, the only thing that I would add is um, outside of um, organizations or threat actors coming together, I mean, there is also the leveraging of one threat to create another. For example, um, we may not necessarily call it a synergy of threats, but 
um, when we have to deal with our election systems or when we have a natural disaster and we know that someone's going to leverage, potentially leverage a natural disaster um, to uh, right. to launch a, an, another attack on, you know, specific organizations. So we've seen that with the, you know, the last hurricanes that we've had where um, they've leveraged hurricanes to launch business in, uh, email compromises as well as phishing and ransomware um, type activities. Uh, you know, to take advantage of the, the initial threat that we're experiencing. Maybe you have time for one more question. Uh, yeah. Uh, another question is uh, for Maria and Chris, actually. Uh, you guys both mentioned having tools that will integrate and promote businesses and process now. Can you expand on how you see tools helping you do that? Maria, why don't you start? Well, you know, um, one of the things that we'd like to, to, to focus on as far as our tools is, it's not necessarily, the, when, when I look at tools and I look at the purchasing of a tool and, and whether or not it fits into our um, ecosystem, it's not necessarily looking at is it solely a, a cyber you know, specific tool. It's mainly how can it enable our business owners to gain that, the, the, the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of their system to, to help them um, move forward with their business initiatives. And so those are the types of things that we look at um, because I think that that will help to bridge the gap between the, the disconnect that we have with the operations group where we're considered to this day in some cases, you know, the doctor knows, which we're trying to change that aspect. So it's focusing it, on how can we not only leverage um, si uh, security tools in particular, but the, the business tools that are out there efficiently and securely um, to better the, uh, the organization. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that's how our, my thoughts and feelings are as far as, as, as it pertains to our IT tools supporting the business. Sounds good. I, I, I totally agree with that, Maria. And, and we have a, a, um, a unique situation here in Nebraska when we did our, did our consolidation. We had a lot of uh, different, all the agencies had their own way of doing things. Uh, so they had their own tools. They had their own SIM tools. They had you know, all these tools that they were using to report on on um, uh, security. And we found that you know when we bring them into our fold and when we bring them into the CIO's office, that what we can do is we can um, you know take a look at what they have and what another agency has and build on that and basically get an, an enterprise level um, tool. Um, to replace all these disparate systems that are out there right now. So, and that really helped us, um, not just from the perspective of, of increasing our security posture for all of the agencies, but it also reduced our costs. It's, it's, it's interesting because not very often can you increase your security and reduce your costs at the same time. So, but that's something that we actually saw um, in, in this consolidation effort was that you know we were able to remove a lot of the redundant system there and replace it with an enterprise system um, that was much more cost effective for all of the agencies going forward. Yeah, just one other quick thing, and then I think we're going to be out of time. We'll hand it back to Artie and do the wrap up. But I just want to mention one other thing about synergistic threats that we mentioned earlier is it's you know where that might be slightly different than like a blended threat, which is multiple different things coming at you at the same time or used together. Um, I think there's a lot of focus on a lot of prediction reports about looking at. Um, the, the chain of events that the threat actors use to get into an organization and get data out, to exfiltrate the data. So it's really a multi-step process. It's not just one and done, you're in and out. It's really oftentimes getting a foothold, getting in, maybe using one set of tools to get access, another set of tools to go further, another set of tools to, uh, to, to, to very, you know, um, you know, stealth in a stealth mode, you know, get the data out, that kind of thing. So, you know, bringing synergy of, of different uh, attack tools, if you will, that are being used together to, 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 to get data, to cause data breaches, exfiltrate data out of organizations. So anyway, listen, I thank so much. I want to thank uh, Maria and Chris. Great job. Um, RDN PCB, PECB for their uh, uh, sponsoring this. Uh, I'll hand it back to you for the final wrap up. Thank you, uh, Dan. Now, to conclude the presentation, uh, I would highly appreciate it from each one of you if you can just slightly touch on what are some crucial things that we need to keep in mind so we can keep up with the constant evolving cyber threats in the upcoming years. Just uh, slightly. 
the one thing that, or the two things that I would touch on real quickly is, one is definitely establish a continuous monitoring program um, and a true continuous monitoring pro program in the, the sense of the word. And the other thing I would say is, and I touched on it earlier, is to not make everything a personal journey because we can't do this by ourselves. We have to make sure that we are working with our fusion centers, um, all our partners, our, our cyber groups within our, our National Guard, everyone within our organization to build that ecosystem. Chris? For me, it's uh, uh, really just education, um, getting your message out there, uh, making sure that everyone is aware. Anytime that you have the ability of going out and, and learning more, um, as far as the threats are concerned, um, you know, and how to mitigate those threats, um, I think that uh, you know that's that's very very important and very key. Thanks. I think I think well, we're ready to wrap up, Ardian. Yeah. Uh, thank you all uh, once again for this outstanding and very interactive presentation. Uh, we were delighted to have you present with us. I would also like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar uh, and also inform that uh, this session will be recorded and posted on our website as well as on our YouTube channel uh, along with the slides of the presentation. For more information about webinars or anything related to PECB, please visit our website www.pecb.com. Thank you all and have a great day.